So I am a cultural anthropologist. A lot of people respond to it like, what is that? Or they will say, oh, like Indiana Jones? Indiana Jones? Now, he is an archaeologist, and that is a part of the anthropological four-field approach. However, he was unethical, so yeah, he's not a true archaeologist. And again, I'm still not an archaeologist. And then I'll get the response, oh, you don't do that. You like that lady on bones, right? No, I am a cultural anthropologist. She is forensic anthropologist. Now, forensic anthropology is great, but cultural anthropology is also awesome. So a cultural anthropologist is someone who studies the lived communities and the lived experiences of multiple people. I'm particularly interested in institutions of power, particularly or specifically race and memory. So today I'm going to talk a bit about collective memory via Stone Mountain. So collective memory is a dynamic social practice of recollecting the past, of you know, recollection of any kind in regards to previous time. And when you think about collective memory, it's when multiple groups come together to create this one recollection of the past. But in that, we have to be cognizant of power dynamics. Because who, who are included or who will be excluded from this dominant memory? Let me give you an example. Ice cream. Everyone loves ice cream. It's the favorite dessert of life, right? Oh my God, I want to eat ice cream for dinner after, you know, we have a great meal. Or you want ice cream when you're watching a movie. Or popcorn, but ice cream. Or you may say, I'm not doing well today. Let me get some ice cream to help me feel better. So this dominant memory of ice cream, or this collective memory of ice cream, is that it's a wonderful dessert. But there are some people like me who don't remember or consider ice cream a great dessert, or we don't think of it fondly. See, I'm lactose intolerant. So when I think about ice cream, I don't think about comfort. I think about sickness. So ice cream is not my favorite dessert. But no one really talks about people who are lactose intolerant when we talk about how great ice cream is. So let's think about Stone Mountain as an example of how collective memory is then made public when it becomes a public memorial. So when we think about Stone Mountain, right? We love Stone Mountain. Families go to the park and they have wonderful picnics. You may take the scenic railroad to see the beautiful mountain. You're like, oh, it is so fun, a family day. And let's not forget the fantastic laser show during Independence Day. Well, it's like over four days. But everyone comes to the park and they just love it. And so they think of it as you know, a great place to be, especially to bring your families. Also a great place to exercise. But not everyone can successfully make it up the mountain. But either way, it's a great place to exercise. Now, some of us, including myself, do not recognize this park as just this wonderful place. We think about it as a racist place, a place that we do not feel accepted, a place that salutes and exalts the racial oppression of the past. So when you think about Stone Mountain, you have to be mindful of, well, how did Stone Mountain come to be? Like, what led to Stone Mountain? Helen Plain, in 1915, says she wants a Confederate monument. So she started to plan, well, you know, let's have on Stone Mountain. It's a huge mountain, and it could be the biggest Confederate monument in history. So let's do this. So Helen Plain was also the founder and leader of the Georgia United Daughters of the Confederacy. So she was very excited. She said, we can do this. Let's talk to Sam Venable, who owns Stone Mountain, and see what he has to say. He was like, absolutely. He was like, yes, let's do this. See, Sam had ties to the KKK, so Ku Klux Klan, we all know. And he was like, this would be a great place to have a Confederate monument. Now, 1915, let's go back in time. What was 1915? Why was it important to the Ku Klux Klan? What was this? This was the year that the birth of a nation was released in theaters. So Birth of a Nation is this racist film that depicted black men as, this, as these bestial beings who seek to prey on white women. 
And let's not forget, they also had white men in minstrel, in blackface, to depict these black men. And the KKK in this film saved the white woman from these bestial creatures. So based on these stereotypes and the depiction of white and black relations, we have this rebirth of the KKK. So then you wonder, well, where, how did this happen? Where did the rebirth begin? Like, what was this rebirth look like? On top of Stone Mountain, we have a rebirth of the KKK, an official burn, cross burning that occurred on top of the mountain, supported by Sam Venable. The same year, we were starting to create the Confederate monument. And so as you see, you have Colonel Simmons, who led the KKK to the top of the mountain to burn these crosses. So now we understand the racial history of it. And the same year, in 1915, Helen Plain and the Georgia United Daughters of the Confederacy hired a sculptor. His name was Gutzon Borglum. He was very interesting. So he was known for his sculpting and carvings, and they were like, this is a great person to do this. And he got started on it. One thing that's great about him, or interesting about him, not necessarily great, was that he had ties to the KKK. So of course it was fitting for him to be the carver of this mountain, or the sculptor of this mountain. Unfortunately, he disagreed with some of the sponsors. Now again, even the sponsors were included the KKK. But he disagreed with them and left the project after doing the first head. Next thing you know, he went to do Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. So even in South Dakota, we start having conversations about the KKK ties. But we're not going to talk about that today. Let's go back to Stone Mountain. So after this, in 1925, they hired someone else, Augustus Lukeman. See, Augustus Lukeman said, I don't even like Borglum's face that he had a or was carving of Robert E. Lee. What was that? Blasted it off the mountain and said, I'm going to start over. He worked on the carving until maybe 1925, but then some, for only a little bit. He did not even get much done. Because, next thing you know, the property organizer or the project organizers lost the lease on the property. But Lukeman, he was so excited. He said, that's fine. I will come back and do it. I'm sure we will resume this project. No. It took decades. It took the Great Depression over the World War II. It took decades before they got back to this. Now, before the project resumed, it's important to provide more historical context. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education struck down separate but equal. When they did that, there were a lot of people in the South who were like, no, we can't have this, including Georgia Governor Marvin Griffin. He was a separatist. He did not like desegregation, but he was governor. So in 1958, he said, we will resume carving Stone Mountain. We will resume the Confederate monument, building or constructing this Confederate monument. And the difference is he provided legal support. He created the Stone Mountain Memorial Association and also a state clause that allowed this carving to exist. Guess when it ended? Guess when the carving was completed? 1972. Now, many people think it was completed in the early 1900s. No, it was completed in the same time frame as Confederate, Confederate monuments began to come up in the South. And so now we have the biggest Confederate monument in the United States. So, you know, let's fast forward a bit. Now we understand the history. You start to see multiple stakeholders who are involved. Georgia United Daughters of the Confederacy, the state of Georgia, the Ku Klux Klan. But what you don't see or you don't hear are the conversations of African Americans and indigenous peoples. Because this land of, well, initially was owned or was the property of the Muscogee Nation. But they weren't included in these conversations on the Confederacy. Because when you think about collective memory, it's about power, who were in control and who were disenfranchised. 
And so now we see, you know, specific, specifically after many racially uh, motivated attacks against black people in social media, there has been strong backlash to the Confederate monument, including the NAACP, Southern Poverty Law Center, and other African Americans. Now keep in mind, there's still a strong need for Stone Mountain because you have people who support or specifically white nationalists who still gather at this mountain, who still support the Confederacy. So then the conversation becomes, well, what should we do with it then? If you don't like it, what should we do? OK. Andrew Young, who was the former Atlanta mayor, also UN ambassador and civil rights activist, said we should keep the mountain. Why not? I mean, it's a piece of history. And we can talk about it within historical context as well as political context. So let's not destroy it. <laughs> who does that? But then there are some people who are saying, we need to completely get rid of it, destroy it, break it down in some way. So there have been other options. One, give it to the Muscogee Nation, give it back to them, and have them choose, or at least involve them in the choosing what to do next, and choosing what to do next. The other option, let greenery grow. Let nature take its course. The thing is, with Stone Mountain, they have to clean it regularly because things grow on the mountain, right? So don't clean it anymore, and just let it become parts of, part of the, the park. Just let it be a state park. Some people, and I think it's very interesting, put Outkast on there. Why not? Outkast is an amazing Atlanta hip hop group. I'm not against this one because I love Outkast. So I'm for this. Now, what do I think? I do believe there should be a critical conversation about what needs to happen with this mountain, particularly the carvings. People were excluded from the conversation historically. Now that we know about this inclusion, what are we going to do next to include them? I think we should do just like Lukeman did and blast the thing off the mountain. If you want to add outcasts, I'm OK with that as well. And I do think it's important that the Muscogee Nation have priority in these discussions. So there's no right or wrong answer. Well, there could be a wrong one. But there's no right way or one way to deal with the past. So I leave you with this. When you think about collective memory, you have to be intentional about who you're including and excluding from this memory. Who are you involving in these discussions? If we are not intentional in, exclude, in including these different groups, then we will never know the whole history of our past, of our people. Thank you. <laughs>